Excuse me, everybody. I've just been told that because time pressure is so tight that we should start and just hope that people are working their way through. Apparently M3 is a hard room to find. And so here we are talking about access and we can't find the room. There's an irony there. But, but let's, let's begin because we've got people who will be under considerable time pressure for their presentations. And we've shut the door. Thank you. And so, so good morning, everyone. Welcome to this session. I've been asked just to say a few things at the outset to sort of set the stage, and then looking forward to some very interesting presentations from colleagues who have come from millions of miles around the world to be with us. I think my start point is we will only transform the life chances of people with disabilities if we transform our relationships with employers, whether they're business or public sector. All too often in every country I've ever been to, we see well-intentioned employers struggling to find suitable candidates for jobs they have, struggling to get advice on what to do to deliver best practice, struggling to get support from managers after they've employed someone with a disability and something happens and they need support. So if the well-intentioned employers find this too hard, the rest can justify the status quo by just saying, well, too hard, too much trouble, and, they, and things stay as they are. The complex sector that sits between employers and people with disabilities fails to get people into work. It fails people with disabilities because it fails the employer. So my, my career to introduce me, I founded the first business disability network in the UK, Business Disability Forum, and really pleased that Brendan's with us today. Wave. Um, and helped to set up business disability networks in you know, Australia, the wonderful network here, My Ability in Vienna, that Gregor leads, a network in British Columbia. You think the Canadians would have sussed it by now? No, they're also trying to figure this out. And that what we've learned is that if we make it easier for the employer to say yes, we make it easier for people with disabilities. So Business Disability International, set up by Barclays, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, and Infosys, is actually now working to make it easier for all key stakeholders to build new relationships with business and to develop new conversations. We advise public policymakers, NGOs, disabled people's organizations, and of course business, on how to build new productive relationships so that genuinely we see no one is left behind. Our particular focus at the moment is procurement and how procurement from both public and private sector bodies can drive improved disability and accessibility performance across their suppliers and facilitating a new consortium between the Essel Foundation and uh, Equitas Bank in India looking at how we can ensure that microfinance opportunities extend their reach to the poorest of the poor, who are, of course, people with disabilities. This radical rethink that repositions the employer from being the problem, sometimes someone the adversary or the target, to being a valued service user, to then being a potential partner, is particularly crucial in countries where, since the invention in World War I of the employment quotas, we see quotas actively reinforcing deep-rooted employer and society-wide negative assumptions, stigma, and stereotypes. Interestingly enough, not just about people with disabilities, but actually stereotypes about the employer which limit our ability to reform the system that is trying to get disabled people into work. We're asking public policymakers key stakeholders in the whole system to change their world view, to see that making it easier for the employer to say yes as a valued service user, valued stakeholder, is the only way to genuinely transform the life chances of the hundreds of millions that we are talking about through the next three days. And the good news is that we've got people with us today who are going to tell us how they're going out there to make it easier for the employer to say yes which actually sounds like a really useful catchphrase, doesn't it? And if you can justify making it harder for the employer to say yes, well, you're in the wrong session, I guess, today. 
So without further ado, because everyone's under a nine minute or they're in big trouble deadline, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Michael Rimon from Access Israel, who will step up here quickly and go da 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 da. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I see that my name said that I speak Polish and I'm talking about tourism oh, while you were speaking. So I so didn't clever. want to, I'm yeah, sure I didn't want to interrupt you, but uh, um, I move the slides with this. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I have to open with just one uh, sentence. There were uh, uh, the moment of silence in the uh, um, uh, M1. Uh, and as we're speaking, all my employees are on their way to Netta's funeral. And I just want to say thank you, uh, Caroline, and thank you, um, um, Zero Project, for the honor. I can tell you it uh, made a really, really big difference. Uh, so I really appreciate it. And I'm here on her behalf, fulfilling her dream. And she was my partner for the project that I'm going to present today. So help me help you. That's the name of the project. And the idea is uh, to achieve two goals. And the, the, it doesn't work. Okay, so we'll have some technical problem. I'll just continue without the slides until uh, it is uh, set. So our goals, yeah, okay, no problem. So our goals basically are to enable everyone to receive services from service providers that are accessible that are sensitive, that are right for their needs. Um, in a equal, once uh, in, in the past people thought equality is enough, but it's not. It's not just that you receive the services, it's how you receive them, in an independent way, in a respectful way, uh, etc. and that's the basis of this whole project. Uh, another uh, goal of this project was to give, provide tools uh, to service providers that are easy to use and sensible and translate the uh, very difficult laws, legal requirements, social requirements that sometimes mix us up and we don't really understand what is uh, uh, required from us, to simplify it and make people understand what needs to be done. So that was the goal, how do we achieve it? So, oh, now it's working good, right on time. Four pillars, that's what stands in the basis of this project. The first thing is knowledge. You know, we can talk the talk. Um, uh, we have to um, give knowledge, provide knowledge, uh, in order to uh, remove barriers, because people are afraid from what they do not know. Uh, so in every uh, training, accessibility service training we do, we provide knowledge. Sometimes things that, for us, the professionals who deal with accessibility seem pretty obvious, but it turns out that even if you're sitting with the smartest people in the world, what is obvious to us that work daily with people with disabilities is not necessarily obvious to those sitting in front of you. So we provide the knowledge. But you know what? Walking the walk is great. Uh, talking the talk is great. You can't do it without walking the walk. And the Accessibility Trail downstairs will provide you opportunity to do that today. Um, experiencing. It's not enough to talk. You have to feel it. You have to, in Hebrew, there's a word, kishke. You have to get attached to your gut inside and really understand what we're talking about. Getting to know the person behind the disability. It's not enough that I will tell you. I can be a great speaker, maybe not so great, but I'm not the person itself, and I want you to get to know the person behind the barrier, the person behind the disability, and that will remove the barrier. When you will find out that that person has a life, has a wishes, dreams, loves, hates, challenges, difficulties, you will see him as the person. I can tell you that in one of our uh, um, um, trainings for bus, stop, uh, bus drivers, one of the bus drivers came and told me later, you know, I always have uh, bus, uh, on, on the bus people coming up that are blind. And I refer to them as the blind. Today I will see Lydia. I will see the girl, the lady that comes and talks and captured my heart today, and I will remember her forever. And after you have the knowledge and after you have the experience and you got to know the people, we have the fourth pillar. You have to get the tools, provide the tools to pass it on, each one in their own place. And together that will make a change. Now, <clears throat> the solution that we had 
was training accessible services and providing tools to help all with a target audience of service providers, those who provide services to the general public. The method is taking those four pillars and combining one important thing, creating a trend. It's not enough that the laws say you have to. You have to make sure that you create a trend, not come with that disability issue, you know, heavy, oh, they're talking about the disabled. We're coming from a point of strength, a point of pride, a point of, of uh, this is the, you know what, if I can uh, talk teenager at least uh, for a second, the cool thing to do, guys. We do it in a way that is really breaking all stereotypes types and all stigmas and <clears throat> we're an attraction. That's the way to do it. Um, and after that, this all creates a human ramp. And here I want to provide you know, a small example. The whole idea of the prog program is, we always hear when we deal with accessibility or lack of accessibility about the excuses. We don't have the budgets, it's difficult. The difficulties I know, let's put it aside. This training uh, program provides you the tool that tomorrow morning, without adding one cent to your budget, you can provide a more accessible and inclusive service day one. And just imagine a person with disability calling the secretary that sat, sat in the training uh, the next morning and saying, hi, I'm with a wheelchair, I'm coming for a meeting in whatever, your municipality, let's say. And she will say one sentence, oh, don't come in through this entrance, come through the other because the uh, pavement crossing is much more accessible that way. She didn't add a dime but you know what that person understands, that she sees him, that she is looking forward and will be able to provide a better service for him. She sees the person, and that is the difference that is made. That is creating the human ramp. I, I don't want to uh, take great examples from people sitting here in the audience, but we have here uh, the award winners of uh, Access Israel uh, Prize uh, um, uh, of two th 2017, Asuta Hospital, and we received a letter, and actually Neta is the one who uh, uh, read the letter in our, one of our last meetings, of a person that was with mental disability that came to Asuta and had a panic attack. And, you know, no matter how good we are and how great a training we give, we won't be able to give all the examples. We won't ha be able to give all the, the right ways, but we provide the tools. We give the, the, the basics that combine with what you know as a person and you can take it onward. And when the lady that gave him service there understood that the noise is what makes it uh, a problem for him, took off her shoes and made sure that when she's walking with him, she does it quietly, that's the human ramp. So how is it done? And I'll do that really quick. We come, we do a preliminary visit, and that's especially to take pictures of the place. Because, you know, it's very easy to sit and hear um, a presentation with pictures of bad things happening and elsewhere. The idea is to come and show after you see a bad thing elsewhere, and you sit and say, oh, that's uh, ridiculous. Why do they do it that way? And then I click on the presentation, and then a picture of my office and maybe something that happens just around the corner from uh, where the building is. And I say, wait, that's us. We are the ones who have to make a change. So making it very customized, very personal. Um, recruiting the head, you always have to go to the head. Giving the lecture, the experiences, the four pillars, everything that I discussed, and providing tools for implementation. It's not easy, I can tell you, and the light is already orange, so I'll try to rush through this part also. Um, these are the challenges that we're faced when we try to convince people and companies to take this training program. First of all, people think accessibility, physical. That's it. But you know what? Physical accessibility can just get you through the door. What happens when you get there? How is the look on the face of the you know, guard at the entrance? Does he look at you with pity? Well, he needs training because that's not the look that a person with disability would like to see when he comes into a, a place to uh, receive services. The next challenge is, why is it relevant for me? Um, Yuval Wagner, our president, had a talk one w once with uh, uh, one of the shopping uh, malls, and the guy said, listen, oh, it's amazing what you're doing, but please note that um, we don't have people with disabilities in the mall, so it's not really relevant for us. Well, after we did convince them, it became one of their best features and lots of people and families and the business was booming. So we try to provide 
reasons why it's relevant. We uh, <clears throat> see why is it good for me, because an accessible business is a more profitable one. Breaking the stigmas and doing it in a way that doesn't, doesn't only check the box. Our success is just this past year, we counted, Netta and I, just before we came here, 16,000 people. And I know in numbers, it might not look uh, a lot in countries that have a lot of uh, people. In Israel, it's considered a lot. Um, and uh, in percentage, you know, 100, uh, 100 of, out of 200 uh, um, municipalities, 50 percent have undergone um, uh, training, and that's an amazing uh, thing. Another thing, two more points, and then I'll um, get off the stage. Um, um, this last slide. We are here in Zero Project to learn, to share, and to transform information and make sure that we can do it where we're coming from. Well, this program, which I gave you really only in a nutshell, and I'll be more than happy to provide more information, written and oral, of course. This is a duplicatable and sustainable model that each and every one of you in every country can duplicate. Um, uh, it's not expensive, it's not expensive, it's very customized and very easy to adapt to your culture and to your set of legislation. I will be more than happy to provide more um, uh, information. Thank you very much and sorry for being a little late. That's good. Thank you. Can I do a quick check? Hands up if your primary interest is employment, if you're looking at employment. Okay. I just wanted to say that one of the reasons we have so many unemployed people with disabilities is because we fail to knock on this welcoming disabled customer door to open a new conversation with business. So very exciting that you've started there. I've never seen a company that is barrier-free for customers not finding it easier to be barrier-free for job seekers. Thank you. Now I have the privilege of introducing Amin El Sai from Egypt, from Helm. I mean, you've, you've been on stage with us before, but you've got a good story to tell, so please come up. They're all going to speak at once. <laughs> okay, Andrew. Okay, so I'm go going to also introduce uh, Ramaz Meher, because um, we always like to, uh, to share our presentations and give you a quick introduction about Helm. So maybe we can start sharing the slides and, um, yeah, all right, okay. Uh, so, to give you a really quick overview, has anybody ever heard about Halm before? Okay, <laughs> yes, <laughs> we have someone. <laughs> so, um, Halm means dream in, in Arabic, um, and basically the idea of Halm is that our focus is to help persons with disabilities in, in, in Egypt and hopefully around the world also to have uh, the full potential that they can reach through having um, an active part in this society. Uh, and we try to focus on two parts. So uh, last year we actually won for the employment practices that we do and then for the accessibility this year. Um, so. Of course, we all know the big challenge of the everyday life, and maybe in Egypt we have this very clear to us from our employment model because we discovered that no matter how hard we work to make the companies um, hire more persons with disabilities, exactly as was said before, the issue is after they get employed, how people will perceive them. So we created kind of a, of a 360 model like to for companies and for the government sector as well, to give them a whole holistic solution for them to make them understand that it, you cannot work on one part without the other. So we have tried to show that yes, there are a lot of physical accessibility, but it starts from the moment the person wakes up in their, their, their home until they get to the workplace that they aim to go to um, or any act, act of um, anything that they want to do in life. So basically what what we try to do at Helm is that we saw how the effect of someone, for example, who doesn't have the technical knowledge for, for, uh, for, for getting the job that he wants, and how if you give them enough power and, will, and, and the right environment and the support, they actually can change in less than a year. So we have an example like Mohamed Sopay, for example. He now is um, leading 52 employees in, in two years at, um, in L'Oreal, uh, Egypt. And for example, Sopay, when he first worked, he, he he, was, he didn't aspire to become in marketing at all. He was going to be hired as a teller. And when they saw him in one of our activities called the Community Days, so, so we bring all of the employees 
in the company and they share with us a day to make them change their perception. So during the day they play sitting volleyball, they, they can do activities with arts with persons with disabilities, they, they, um, they actually go through different um, games that they would understand how a blind person would act. Uh, for example, they would go into a room and experience how to be blind for about two hours, in our case sometimes an hour. So it opens their eyes about, oh my god, somebody who's blind can actually use a computer and they see them in the, in, in the dark how they use their, their, the software and the mobile phones and everything. So basically this is what transformed us to start our project in Talaq, which is basically an app. So this also fixes another issue, which is access to information. So we discovered that after helping all these companies over a thousand places become more accessible, it wasn't enough. People with disabilities needed to know that these places are accessible, so we created this tool. It's an app and a website that helps persons with disabilities locate the places that they want to go to, depending on their specific needs. Um, so actually, it goes red, yellow, or, uh, um, or, um, or green, and there are different icons that tells them exactly what, uh, what the accessibility level is, and then they can actually read more information in the page itself. And we also created uh, an access guide uh, tool that helps them actually motivate them to go out there and discuss different problems that they have. Um, so actually this is the access guide example and of course people can rate, customers can rate and they can write comments so we would motivate businesses to understand that there is a market value and people need more accessibility features. Um, so I'm going to leave Ramis to explain to you also how we did that and, and how we managed to um, remove the physical barriers. Okay, so taking it on from where Amena uh, talked about the, how we empower people with disabilities, you also need to empower the employers as well. So we do this through different uh, activities, like Amena said, but we also need to um, uh, empower how, how, uh, to see how the government would also take action in terms of making the public spaces accessible, transportation, the streets. It's very difficult for a person to get a job, even if he's very qualified. Going to the job by itself is a journey. So, uh, so this is why we started by uh, changing some of the locations to create accessibility models. We partnered with different uh, organizations in order to sponsor uh, main buildings and very difficult buildings to change, like uh, temples in Egypt, Luxor, and uh, uh, streets in Egypt. It's very difficult to change streets, for example, like Cairo University, which is one of the streets we worked on. It has 250,000 students going in and out every day. 1,000 of them are, are students with disabilities. So creating an, accessibility, uh, an accessible model and partnering with the governor of, uh, of Giza, which is the, one of the biggest uh, governorates in Egypt, to create a model helps the government later on to replicate the model easily in other streets as well. So, and, and even having like, the tactile blocks, which did not exist in Egypt, we had to create the, the mold itself and start distributing it in other governates, like in, uh, uh, in Luxor, for example, and I'll just jump into this uh, slide. So in Luxor, we also signed a protocol with the governor, and our plan is to go into different cities and create different models with governors so they can replicate the model and start implementing, implementing it in different uh, areas. Um, I'll just show you a video, which this is how we, brought, we got the buy-in of the government. We did an, a very huge awareness campaign in Egypt to uh, help the society be more aware of the issues uh, facing people with disabilities in the streets. And we got two Egyptian celebrities, of course, I'm, I'm not sure if you all know them or not. They volunteered to be part of the campaign, and it reached over 10 million uh, uh, views in Egypt. Organically. Yeah, organically. So I'm just going to show you the video, and you're going to see the partners at the end, and, and I'm just going to wrap up after. قبل ما بنزل من البيت بفكر مليون مرة حاجات كتير بتكون بسيطة وسهلة لأي حد وبالنسبة لنا ممكن تهدد حياتنا لو حد عاش تجربتنا هيقدر يفهم معاناتنا المنحدر أو الرامب مش موجود فبتضطر تمشي في نص الشارع ولو لقيت بقى المنحدر معمول صح هتلاقي حاجة تانية غلط تعدية الشارع تكاد تكون مستحيلة. بفرح قوي لو لقيت اسانسير وشغال. مع كل خطوة 
مش عارف هتقابل ايه في طريقك ولو حد بقى تطوع عشان يساعد ومش عارف يساعد ازاي ممكن تبقى كارثه في اكتر من 14 مليون شخص ذوي الاعاقه في مصر مع كل شير للفيديو ده في تبرع هيروح لمؤسسه حلم يساعدنا نخلي في اماكن اكتر مجهزه لذوي الاعاقه حياتهم تبقى اسهل فنقلل من المخاطر اللي ممكن يقابلوها ساعدنا ننشر الفيديو ده So, so basically, there's a lot of logos that are in Arabic, which is the Metro Authority in Egypt, the Giza Governorate, and we need to get their buy-in in order to, for them to replicate the different models. The, the objective of this campaign was to launch the campaign to raise the awareness to the public and to different sectors. The business sector, of course, is involved. They are funding the changes that are going to happen. We're only developing two metro stations. But the idea is not to just implement one street or one metro station. The idea is to implement one, and then the metro authority are now having a plan to 2022 in order to change all the metro stations so they're accessible to everyone. Uh, and we're also renovating uh, other streets in Egypt and in other governorates. Uh, this is, those are like some of the changes that we're planning to do. We've got the opportunity to travel to Japan, to the US, and other uh, places where we learned how uh, to to be able to do different changes depending on the sector you're working on. So those are just pictures of accessibility changes like uh, having a braille map, a tactile, uh, blocks, uh, routes, and, and signage. Uh, we always like to uh, thank our, uh, our team before we uh, wrap up. Those are the people behind the dream. And I think I'm just on time. <laughs> So uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I particularly like the way you've linked the need for accessible uh, journeys to the need to get to work. Now, it's not just a drop curb, it's enabling someone to become a taxpayer. You'd think that would be an easy sell to public policymakers. You'd think. I'm going to introduce now Omar Ahmad from NOWPDP who is going to introduce us to his program. Will you have a colleague with you? Uh, no, no it's great. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here. We're very humbled by the Zero Project invitation, and we look forward to sharing our practice. We've flown all the way from Pakistan, my colleague and I, Samar Nakvi, who's uh, here with us in the audience. So before I bore you all with my monotonous voice, I will let the video introducing now PDP do the talking about who we are, and then I'll move slowly to the project that we are here presenting. In this world, every person is different from the other. He keeps faith and keeps faith from the other. He 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 keeps faith from the other. کبھی اختلاف رائے کی بیس پر ہوتا ہے یہ کبھی کبھی پریشانی کا باعث بنتا ہے لیکن اسی کو اگر ہم اپنی سٹرنٹ بنا لیں تو پھر ہم ایک طاقت بن جاتے ہیں ترقی کے طرف جاتے ہیں اکورنگ تو دیو ایچ او ففٹین پرسنٹ آف دا ورلڈ پاپولیشن آر پرسن وتھ ڈسبلٹیز وی اپلائی دیٹ ٹو پاکستان دیٹ میکس مور دین دا پاپولیشن آف کراچی ذرا سوچیں کہ کراچی کی آبادی کسی نہ کسی معذوری میں مبتلا ہے اور معذور افراد اپنے خواب پورے نہیں کر پا رہے کیونکہ عوام کا جو رویہ ہے وہ ان کے ساتھ ٹھیک نہیں ہے ناؤ پی ڈی پیز جرنی بگین ان 2008 ایز اے ڈسبلٹی انکلوژن انیشیٹو وی ورک ان دی ایریاز آف ایجوکیشن اینڈ اکنامک امپاورمنٹ فار پرسنس وتھ ڈسبلٹیز تھرو آر ڈیڈیکیٹڈ پروگرامس دستور اینڈ یقین اینڈ تھرو ادر انٹروینشنز ایٹ ناؤ پی ڈی پی وی سون ریئلائز دیٹ یو کین ناٹ ڈو اینی تھنگ ان اے ویکیوم You need to collaborate with all other stakeholders in the society. You need to change mindsets. It's about changing behaviors. It's about changing the conversations from pity to empathy. To date, now PTP has managed to make 6,000 people aware of disability, trained 567 children and adults with disabilities, made 227 placements, and facilitated 1,200 SCNICs. 
we need to talk about an inclusive pakistan we need to talk about a compassionate pakistan we need to talk about a pakistan where everyone is equal hame bahisiyat qoum sabko milke shamuliyat ke mawaqe paida karne honge taaki mazoor afraad is maashre ka karama shahri ban sake aur sustainable development goals pure ho sake Thank you. Uh now a bit about why we are here. We're talking about the project that we're here to present. The project is called Yaqeen. It's a word in Urdu which means belief. Self belief, belief of power, and it has three E's in it which actually mean embedded, empowered, and equal. We hope that by embedding persons with disabilities, we empower them. and by creating empowerment opportunities we make them equal and contributing members of society in pakistan so that's the project we are here to represent it speaks about what the challenges are that pakistan and persons with disabilities face as some of our colleagues who went before us spoke about the lack of empathy the lack of uh, the lack of opportunities the barriers to entry a lot of these things are very common across the world when it comes to persons with disabilities and that's why we initiated this project with partnership of Institute of Architects Pakistan because the physical accessibility focuses on those persons where the barriers of entry were the most limiting and Institute of Arch Architects Pakistan is a body which is spread across the nation of Pakistan and works with different organizations to include and make them architecturally accessible and particularly with us uh we premise this project on the law of pakistan which is accessibility code of pakistan 2006 and we created a model accessible workplace the model accessible workplace is our own office which is located in the heart of the city of karachi and it actually was an abandoned dispensary that we took up and actually made completely accessible for persons with disability who are our colleagues as well as those who want to come and utilize our services as an organization uh while we approach the project that we are here to represent yaqeen is a four pronged approach step 1 is we do a an detailed infrastructural accessibility uh review of the premises of whoever the partner is that we are trying to work with we follow this up by doing extensive sensitization sessions to raise awareness about disability amongst the staff of the organizational corporate then we try to place persons with disabilities so that we can see the sensitization in practice because words can only do so much if an organization is not willing to implement these changes and high persons with disabilities all these conversations are moot and finally to ensure sustainability of these practices within the organization we create master trainers and we create a hr policy guidebook which guides their human resource policies through uh, accessible and inclusive guidelines so this is a four pronged approach that we adopt uh how do we make sure this innovative we try to target the industry leaders we have targeted the largest bank in the country we have targeted the largest utility provider in the country which Uh, target the largest retailer because when these leaders lead the rest tend to follow and that is why we have established you know utilities the bank providers and so on and so forth so that basic amenities that were inaccessible to persons with disabilities are now accessible everyone needs a bank account everyone needs power and electricity in their homes and that's why we wanted to ensure that persons with disabilities had access to banks had access to utilities had access to these things which are a basic tenet of everyone's functioning life uh we focus on infrastructure we focus on attitudes the barriers to entry cannot just be limited to physical barriers the mental barriers as well and that's one of the biggest challenges that we face and we have tried to collaborate with local government and as well as big corporates to ensure that this is practiced across the board 
Uh, how are we doing this? We're trying to make unconventional changes. As some of our colleagues from Egypt were highlighting, they've created tactile walking services. In Pakistan, there's a dearth of demand. So we had to create aluminum tactile services because there was an increase in supply of that with some local manufacturers. We worked in the Himalayas and the Hindu Kush, the mountain ranges up north, where we actually made schools accessible by making wheelbarrows, where children can take their own community members to school so that there is abundance of education. So this is some of the ways that we're trying to do sustainable solutions. As of 2017, not to blow our own horn, but we have done over 100 locations. We have worked with 250 plus people. That's not a large number when you talk about a country like Pakistan, but at least the dial has to be moved and the policy makers and important people have to be addressed. Uh, we have laid the basis for self-employment. Because of a lack of education in Pakistan, about 95% of persons with disabilities in Pakistan lack education and employment. We have created a program for self-employment, business startups, which has allowed persons with disabilities to become self-reliant and actually has yielded really good results for us. Uh, we have trained 750 plus persons in various disabilities last year. And we have placed 400 people in the leading corporates of the country to ensure that these people with disabilities have a right to livelihood. Uh, some of our successful interventions, it's about a five-pronged approach. We believe shanacht, which is an Urdu word mean, means identity, and which is the first and basic right of every person with disability. There is no recognition of persons with disabilities. As we said, there are 20 million odd persons with disabilities in Pakistan, but the locals only have seven 150,000 people, the government has recognized only 750,000 people with disabilities. The census understated the numbers by a many, many, many percentage points. So that was one of the things that we did by giving them an identity first. Then education, talim, which means educating them. Hunar, which means giving them skills. Then employment, rozgar. And finally, the khud mukhtar, which means self-reliance. I think these things sum up exactly what we are trying to do. And I think what we are facing challenges with, as is common with most of the disability sector, financing. We move from project to project, even though the biggest service providers want to take this on, the cost element makes it cost prohibitive for a lot of them. I will end this on a note that if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We're here all of these three days. Thank you for your time. We really appreciate everything that you've done. Appreciate it. Thank you. I really like the way you brought these statistics alive. We were deviled by statistics, aren't we? Karachi, I'll remember that. And I think every business leader you talk to will remember that. We need to do more to make these numbers seem real. Now I'm going to introduce Maris Muse, who has come to us from Germany to talk about his project, his program, PKSL. Hi, everyone. Such a pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Marius Muse. I'm from Germany, from an organization called Pixel, and I'll be talking to you about uh, something we call the Inclusive Lab Sessions. And I'm here today with Daniela Bayerle, who is working for Minds and Makers. Minds and Makers is a design thinking agency that we collaborated with on this project, and with my colleague Christoph Wiche, um, who's one of our simplification experts at Pixel. Pixel is an organization that tries to foster digital inclusion and digital simplification. And we all came together on a project that was invented when E.ON, which is one of the leading energy providers in Germany, asked how can we make our services simple? How can we ensure that all our customers understand how our services work? And how can we make our touch points as accessible as possible? And it was not just this general concern the company had, but also they had some issues with people who were unable to pay their bills on time and to provide the energy company with the right meter amounts of how much energy had, they had used during the years. So they were coming to us with a problem that would cost them a lot of money. Um, you can imagine that if in the end somebody had to be cut off from energy, that would 
not only cause a lot of problems for the person, but also generate a lot of costs on the company side. So we said to ourselves, okay, who, who are we going to ask? And we said, okay, the, who is the expert? Who is somebody who can actually reduce those barriers in communication that were existent? And our people with learning disabilities, we call them pixel experts, seem to be the perfect fit for this task. So what we created um, was something we call inclusive lab session. What happens during one of those lab sessions? Um, we would go through a typical customer journeys and our pixel experts would say, hey, this is really difficult. I really don't understand this part. Couldn't we do it this way? Um, also, they would see the information material the company was using up to this point and they would say, okay, I can't really read this, I don't understand where to enter my information, all these kinds of issues. And they were consulting the company on how to improve their materials and their touch points with the customers. This, went on, this is uh, valid for online touch points and also for offline touch points such as flyers. And as I said, at the center of, our, of this consulting sessions were the people with learning disabilities and they were asked, how would you go around this? If you were in the situation that you had to enter that information, wouldn't know where you should put it, how would you go around this? What would be your workaround? And from this, the managers of Aeon learned on how to simplify their services to avoid the barrier in the first place or to make easy workarounds for things that were not as accessible as they wished them to be. We have the great pleasure to have one of our experts here today, um, Christoph was uh, part of all those sessions, and um, I'm going to ask him real quick what his experience of those sessions was. Christoph, wie war es für dich, uh, diese Sessions durchzuführen? Yeah. Come on. Ja, also die Sessions waren sehr gut, sehr uh, auf Augenhöhe. Wir haben von E.ON gelernt und E.ON hat von uns gelernt. So he said that um, what, what he liked most about it is it, it was great sessions, it was a lot of fun, but also he said that um, those sessions were on an eye-to-eye -eye level. So they learned from us and we learned from them. So they didn't feel as if they were standing by, but they were actually communicating on the same level. Here's some more pictures um, from those lab sessions. So you can see on the upper part, we actually cut out the whole flyer and the offline materials and recreated them. And um, you see Christoph there and some other experts of us. Now, Daniela is going to talk to you about um, what the results of our initiative were. So as Mario said um, before, we had Martin Makers um, we developed a new service for our client Aeon. They, in a nutshell, came to us and uh, wanted a service that prevents their customer from cutoffs and basically energy poverty. So this new service, um, suited successful as a um, pilot study showed that 93% of the cutoffs um, could be prevented and um, customers were safe from energy poverty and basically from humiliation. Um, and a very important role in this success played uh, the Pixel uh, Lab sessions, since all the materials that we um, that we need to provide the service were tested and redesigned by Christoph and his colleagues, the Pixel experts. Um, our new service, Zahlhilfe, it's called, um, is now implemented Germany-wide, and exclusively uses the materials we tested and designed with the Pixel Lab. So, but like, why is um, this collaboration so successful and so innovative? Um, Marius mentioned it before. The collaboration between Tixel, Minds and Makers and Eon wasn't only a sponsoring thing or a, like a corporate social responsibility campaign, but it was a real collaboration. And instead of only sponsoring Pixel, we took money from an actual private sector business unit, sorry, and took it to the Pixel Lab, which is a social organization. And um, as Christoph already mentioned, the collaboration happened on eye level. The 
uh, E.ON managers took the advice of the pixel experts very seriously and um, last but not least in the end like um, the all the materials we designed had a measurable um, feasible impact on E.ON's business. You can really see the economic success um, through the Seilhilfe project and the materials we designed together with the Pixel Lab. Okay, so um, I think the, the great part uh, Daniela just mentioned, we, we received money uh, as a consulting fee and not as a donation or anything like that. So we're creating actually a business case for people with disabilities um, that would put them in an expert position and not in something, not in a position where they would also be there, but you know, not the experts or not have their own field of expertise. So that was one of the great things. Um, as a final outlook, we um, do a lot more at the Pixel Lab, uh, not only those lab sessions, but we also teach elderly people how to use the computer, which is also done by our Pixel experts. They become teachers and train people who have not that much experience in the computer. Um, and it's a very innovative and co-working space uh, that is actually right now, we have one in Düsseldorf and one in Bielefeld, two German locations where we're looking to scale up our activities to other places. And if you want to know any more, please come find us at, our, at the exhibition space and we'll answer all the questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. That's a great story. As someone who can't understand her electricity bill, I think Eon should come to the UK with this story. I, I think also, though, what we see is you've demonstrated the value of not just user testing, but expert user testing, and how if you look at journey analysis on both the customer and the employment front, you can either do what you've done and sell consultancy in this model. I'd like to think they paid a lot of money for what you did. But also, mystery shopping when you've got applicants with disabilities trying to mystery shop their way through a, an online recruitment process, I think you'll find that you get very powerful feedback that might actually enable employers to get the message that they're knocking out good people by the way e-online recruitment works, never mind online service provision. And so our final speaker is... Always have your paperwork with you. Is the uh, motto there? is Hannes Hofer from the Tobacco Monopoly Agency here in Austria. Hannes, please. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to start with a question up front. Who of you is smoking? Please dare to admit, have a smoke over there. Are there any smokers? Smoke over here, smoke over there. It's a dying Dying breed. There are about three smokers, four smokers who admit that they're smoking in this room. In Austria, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, we have 24% of the adults are smoking. When you, three or four, or the 24% of the Austrian smokers want to buy a cigarette, they have to go, they have to go to a separate shop. We call those shops Tabak Trafik. The way we organize those shops is with a public social franchise system. The reason why we call it a public system is that there is an agency that's deciding who gets a shop. It's deciding where we place a shop and what kind of products we sell in this shop. By the way, this is what I'm doing. I'm the managing director of this agency. The reason why we call it a franchise system is that obviously all of those shops they have a contract, a franchise contract with my agency. They have certain rights and certain obligations. What are the rights? Obviously the first right is to sell the legal cigarette tobacco stuff thing. 
they have the right of a certain region and they have a guaranteed profit margin. On the obligation side, they have to, or they, they are allowed to, to have the signature of our brand mark, which is this Rauchring, we call it. They have also the obligation to protect young people from smoking. Obviously, they're not allowed to sell it to them. The reason why we call it a social franchise system is that the core criteria to get a shop is disability. All those shops are reserved for people who have disability. And among many applicants who are disabled, the one with a less family income gets rewarded with a shop. At the moment, oops, we have 1,277 disabled people who run their own shop. They earn an average profit margin of 120,000 euro a year. Obviously, they have to pay a franchise fee that's 0.2% of their net purchasing price. And I see them getting these shops similar like winning in a lottery, but I think it's even better, but it's because it starts their a new life for them, a new life that they're self-employed. And this is what the trafficanten that we call them say themselves about what it means to them to run their own shop. And these are comments that I took out of our annual report that we have full of all those stories. And I just translated a couple of them, and you can read them out, some in German, some in English. They're saying they're, again, part of the society. They're saying, well, to them, to them, it's their dream job. And they're saying, well, they carry, again, responsibility. They're getting out of unemployment, getting into life again. To be able and to be allowed to run a shop, you have to go through an academy and you have to pass a test. I go there when, the, when those people pass the tests. They're so happy when they pass the test, they start to cry because this means that they now can start a new life. And this is when our organization, we always get against those pimples on this strong empathy that we see there. Obviously, you can feel that I'm convinced of what we're doing, but we said we want to have other evidences. So we asked an independent institute and do a research on what we are doing and do a survey and talk to those shop owners. And we got lots of insights, lots of answers, obviously of things that we can do better. But to bring the outcome to just one line, this is the line that I want to share with you. After five years having a shop, two out of three they were saying our lives did improve to the situation before. What did the others say? They said that life did not change. Um, to summarize it, obviously we have challenges. Obviously tobacco is not a great product. And happily we, we can say that the sales of tobacco, they decline the sale of lottery declines and the sale of newspaper declines. So what we have to do is we have to think about a sustainable business model for the, the shop owners. 
What I'm here for is, I want you to make sure that the retail of sensible legal consumer goods is linked to a societal problem. In our case, it was tobacco with disability. In, uh, when I talk about sensible consumer goods, as I said, we use tobacco. Other, in other countries, other consumer goods are seen more sensible. It could be alcohol. And then there is a very big worldwide trend. It's a discussion on legalizing cannabis. And when it gets to this product, it's also the question, what is the retail channel look like? And can this retail channel be linked to, let's say, disability? Our organization is driven by a vision. And this is a vision to be used as a reference. So please use the Austrian public social franchise system at your reference when you think about these problems at home. Find more information on our website or feel free to get in contact with me. This is my email address. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I do think you remind us of the need as we see so many changes in terms of the workplace to find creative ways to anticipate where the jobs are going to be and to find creative ways to get people with disabilities a fair shot at those jobs. Absolutely. Can I check? Have we miraculously got 10 minutes left? Yes. Well done, all of you. Though, of course, we had a basic request, which was that you sit up there, which you didn't. But people can see your names. So please come up real fast while everyone thinks about the question that you really want to make sure you ask, and who you want to ask. 10 minutes. So where do I get my first question while people are sitting down? Yes, please, would you say who you are when you ask your question? Do we have hand mics? Oh, we've got mics up there, okay. Hi, I'm Bianca Prince, uh, ING Bank. Um, I'm working as project manager accessibility and trying to align uh, in regard uh, all involved uh, businesses from HR to uh, IT, for example. Um, and what I find interesting and in, in many stories, and uh, it's also the thing I know is aligning accessibility in regards to uh, jobs. Um, and what we're currently looking at, for example, is uh, make sure that our IT staff uh, is equipped to support access accessible build. Um, and what you see is it's a new topic and it's hard. And I was curious uh, if anybody had any experience in that application. Uh, has anyone from the panel experience in upskilling IT departments in private sector organizations? No? I can, I yes? Can, uh, and it's not necessarily um, the project that I was discussing, but uh, if I understood correctly your question, um, in Israel there is a law requiring IT to be uh, accessible, uh, and it's great that there's a law, but as you say correctly, if they don't know how to do it, then it doesn't really help. Um, uh, so we are trying uh, in Israel, uh, Access Israel has an accessibility uh, training center that does provide courses. Um, a lot of convincing has to be done when it's at the initial stages because they don't necessarily see the reason why they need to go and study uh, the specific uh, topic. So just like the presentation I gave, challenges you have to overcome and see how to convince in a positive way and, and train it. Um, but I think that if you create a trend and make sure that uh, it's something that uh, the people, the leaders of the IT uh, world are accepting and starting to uh, uh, you know, commit to it and learn about it and publicize it, then you know, people will follow. That's at least something that we uh, succeeded in Israel. 
Just a quick uh, yes. point on that as well. Uh, we, in Pakistan, there is a prominent Scandinavian telecommunication company called uh, Teleno, which has very evolved uh, systems in terms of integrating persons with disabilities in IT. Uh, and they've laid out about a five-year plan or where they want to involve persons with disabilities in very evolved jobs like software designers, uh, project managers. But again, uh, to the earlier point, there's a lack of education which will take some time in bridging. Uh, but right now there are evolved multinational companies in at least parts of our world which are trying to you know, change the paradigm and bring these uh, you know, highly skilled jobs in IT to the fore. And can I make a, a suggestion for everyone really? The Technology Task Force, which is led by chief technology officers from Barclays Bank and the KPMGs and all the big corporates in the UK environment, have put a maturity model online. If you look to the website for Business Disability Forum, the Technology Task Force, there's a maturity model which enables any CIO or CTO to measure their accessibility performance across the whole business and then to plan improvements in a very structured way. And there are toolkits available to any IT practitioner, professional, that have been developed by their counterparts in other companies. And again, those toolkits are all in the public domain. So it just might be helpful to, to actually check out what's already there. And the procurement task force that we lead, the global procurement task force, is about to pilot an IT tender tool. Happy to talk to anyone about that afterwards, which will make it easier for procurement to buy accessible technology in the first place. And finally, G3 ICT are running a session in this conference, mm -hmm. and they have done some outstanding work looking at how you engage the technology professional in such a way that he sees that making systems work for people with disabilities makes it easier for everyone to do their jobs and makes it easier for everyone to access goods online. So let's talk later, perhaps, about some of that. Yes, please, another question here. Am I audible? I think okay. so. Okay. Uh, so my name is Shankar. Uh, I'm the founder of, uh, of InClub, which is a matchmaking app for people uh, with disabilities um, from India. And uh, this question is for everybody, including uh, yourself, Susan. Um, uh, so we see that a lot of people are creating or trying to create job opportunities for people with disabilities. Uh, but the kind of job that they are actually getting people into are rather monotonous uh, uh, jobs and uh, aren't jobs where there is a lot of thought leadership. Um, let's imagine a, a, a company with about a million employees and just one person with a disability and that one per person is the managing director. Uh, would, would there be any need then to, the, uh, to uh, teach the company or any, everybody in the company about accessibility because I think everything from top to bottom uh, in infrastructure uh, or otherwise will be accessible. Uh, my question really is how do you think that we can uh, get people to, uh, to encourage people to uh, or develop something which gets uh, people with disabilities up higher up the rank, right. which will solve the entire problem in itself. So I'm going to ask the panel to be really quick. Pretend you're bullets. Answer that. Um, OK, so basically we have, um, because we worked with creating the 360 model, as we mentioned in our presentation, so what we do with the companies to help them understand how to utilize people in the right jobs, as you said, actually this is exactly how we work. We try to create ambassadors of persons with disabilities in very difficult positions, and we always tell them, you don't have to hire 100, just hire one, and then he would actually make it work for the other people, because then even if other um, examples would not continue or somebody else would be working in the company. So what we would do is, for example, we'd provide a whole set of solutions like accessibility audits. So for them, when you're saying, should we provide a service for the company, what we do is we provide for different um, uh, for different people within the, the company itself, starting from the management, uh, a consultancy solution of how to audit their buildings and how to make sure that their full experience of the person with disability, whether as a customer or as a, an employee, to, to become fully accessible. So, so basically we take the global ISO standards and the ADA standards and then we follow them uh, through. So 
that's one solution. I hope it's useful. And yes, question? Yeah, I just want to correct one assumption you said. We happen to have in Israel the largest bank, the head of the largest bank is with a disability. That does not mean that that bank is accessible for employment for people. It is a, they do employ and everything is great, but they didn't take that assumption. You have, it's not enough to decide to, to uh, uh, employ people with disability. It's not enough to just check the box. You have, there's a whole process. It doesn't matter if the head is with the disability. There's training, there's a process, and you have to make sure to do it right. You don't do it right the first time. It will be much, diff, much more difficult for that company to incorporate uh, employees with disability the next time. And in terms of moving away from the assumption that people with disabilities come in at entry level jobs almost, if you look at, if you look at the Australian Employers Network on Disability, they run an internship program matching disabled students looking for internships with companies looking for interns over 10 years, and the, the impact has been very significant in terms of challenging assumptions on both sides of the table. One more question I think I have. If they're really quick questions, please. No, no not all. Okay, at least you're honest, thank you. <laughs> quick question. Uh, yes, very quickly. In certain sectors, there is a very high turnover of, sorry, Gavin Neat of Neatbox. In some sectors, there is a very high turnover of staff, uh, certainly tourism and, and a lot of other hotel sectors. sectors. Uh, how do we make sure that the, the training that's given to staff members does not disappear as this staff uh, grouping just keeps moving forward? That's a jolly good question. Who's going to answer that? Michelle? Uh, well, uh, as I said, and I tried to rush through my presentation, I tried to rush through my presentation. I'll be more than happy to uh, elaborate on it. We have, that's the customization. We have a lot of types of, I think, nine types of uh, training uh, methods that are, one, some of them are equipped and, and specialized for uh, uh, very high turnover. The idea is to keep the knowledge in the company and the tools in the company, but be able to provide in a quick, time efficient, uh, and still, you know, the gut, changing the gut uh, for, those, uh, uh, for those employees that are, even if they're here for a very short time. There is a way, it works, I can't answer in two minutes, I'll be more than happy to elaborate. And what we have seen work is getting at least key information about the commitment to welcoming, say, disabled customers into induction. So we look at induction and it, it's bedded into an induction process. Yes. Timekeeper, do I get into trouble if I have another question? One more question, I'm allowed. Please, over here. So, uh, Mikael Staplud from Tingtun in Norway. A uh, question for Pixel about the return on investment for uh, E.ON when they are adapting their services for reaching out for more people. Um, can you indicate how you could calculate the return on this investment, maybe in terms of less um, connections to their switchboard for questions or other ways? Money saved. Let's talk money. Can you document how much money you've saved, Eon? No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you would have to ask Eon, actually. Um, we could um, measure how, how expensive um, the, the breakup of, of one customer or the relationship with one customer is for Eon and then multiply that by the number uh, of things. I don't have those numbers, to be honest. Um, but you would be able to actually uh, calculate what, how much money was saved there. Um, we hope to get those numbers. I don't know if, if we do. Um, but also, you would have to somehow calculate the social return on investment. And you know there's methods out there, but um, we, we will have to work on that one as well. But it's not only a social return of an investment, it's an actual return of investment. Yeah. And this pilot we run, um, as I said, 93% 90, were, um, 90 per, 93 suspensions were, um, uh, could be prevented. So this is actual money within this pilot. But we are not allowed to talk about numbers, of course. I do think, though, that it illustrates the dilemma here. If this was a business audience, yeah. they would have asked for exactly that. So how much did it cost yeah. and what was that return? And I think the way you calculated it, well, at least in the sphere of we had to cancel and we connect, we know that costs a fiver every time, and you can document that. I wouldn't hesitate to extrapolate on those figures. Very powerful. We've got to go.
This is the kind of session where we could just keep going and they won't let me. Thank you so much for turning up. Thank you to our panel who did an outstanding job to time. Absolutely. And, and do connect after. They can't stop us from talking after, can they? I just want to take a stab at responding to your question just because of something basic that we have tried to do in Pakistan. Uh, there's a, something called the minimum wage uh, that is paid, that is required by the government to be paid, which is 15,000 rupees per month. So what we have told the businesses is that, and they have to have a certain quota of people on their workforce, and if they're not paying that, uh, they're not hiring those people, they have to pay that money uh, into an account. And the losses that the national ex exchequer, the GDP losses, are between 11 billion to 20 billion, can go up to 20 billion for not including persons with disabilities into the workforce. So that can be broken down by any, any company based on the number of people that they have. 5% of their employees have to be persons with disabilities. If they don't hire that, that's multiplied by 15,000 rupees. That's the, you know, sort of the value proposition that we also try to give to people. Again, very basic, fundamental, but that's what we're trying to do. Well, I made my views of quotas clear. We'll talk after. Thank you very much.